Thanks so much. Okay, understood that. Uh, so thanks a lot, Francesca and, and, and Francesco, for uh, inviting me and for organizing this workshop, which uh, I, I, I very much enjoy. Uh, I should first of all apologize to Peter Verde's team. <laughs> because I gave an almost identical talk last week uh, at a workshop that we co-organized. Uh, so it's not exactly the same, uh, the same talk because I took some feedback uh, into account when I revised my, my slides, uh, but it's going to be ma still massively uh, overlapping the, the, the old, uh, the old uh, talk, so I apologize for that. Um, all right, uh, so what I want to do is to defend uh, a logic of factual identity, which I sometimes call factual equivalence, uh, that I uh, defended in a previous paper, okay, against uh, a, a, an objection that seems to be to be very powerful. It's an objection, as we will see, that has been raised by uh, several people uh, independently, which is a sign that you know the the, 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 the proposed logic called for uh, uh, an objection of that sort. Okay. Uh, the background of the discussion is a certain conception uh, of grounding as worldly, okay. Uh, which I uh, put forward in, uh, in uh, a paper uh, called uh, Grounding Truth Functions in 2010. Uh, it's also a conception which appears in Kit Fine's famous Guide to Ground paper. Uh, and it's a conception that uh, Alex Kyles and myself uh, defend and use in uh, a recent paper, uh, uh, Grounding Essence and, uh, and Identity. Okay. Um, the defense of, of my logic of factual identity involves uh, an important distinction between factual identity and propositional identity, hence uh, the title of the, uh, of the presentation. Okay, uh, what I do in, in, in this presentation is, is, is massively expand on, on, the, on the footnotes, uh, on the actually already long footnotes uh, in uh, another paper that Alex and I uh, recently uh, wrote. So th this presentation is really and it revolves around this, uh, the defense of that system for uh, factual identity, uh, which I had introduced in the past. Uh, I don't have a paper yet uh, uh, linked to this presentation. It might very well be that the paper will be more centered on the very distinction between factual identity and propositional identity with, as an application, a defense of my uh, system for factual identity, right? So, um, okay. Uh, a few words about grounding first. Uh, so, as you know, uh, the standard, the most standard, probably uh, formulation of grounding claims uh, invokes uh, a predicate. So we say things like the fact that A, the fact that A prime, blah blah blah, uh, together ground the fact that B. Okay, so predication on 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 on, 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 on facts. Uh, I, for several reasons, I prefer the the, the, the operator formulation, and more particularly this particular. Uh, operator formulation, it's being the case that A, it's being the case that A prime and so on, uh, make it the case that B, okay. So another oper operator formulation that people sometimes uh, use is the because uh, formulation. I don't like the because formulation because it really links uh, uh, too closely grounding with explanation, it takes grounding to be a form of explanation. I prefer to distinguish between grounding on one hand and grounding explanations uh, on the other hand, so that's why I prefer that uh, that particular way of uh, uh, formulating uh, grounding claims uh, using an operator. Okay, uh, so I'm going to use the standard kit fine uh, notation for uh, for these uh, operator claims. Okay, and I'm going to uh, use expressions like uh, a a prime together ground b, even though that's not grammatical uh, to express the the the, the, the what. What the initial locution uh, uh, says, uh, and also even I'm um, sometimes even, even going to use the predicate way of formulating things, but that's only going to be for reasons of convenience. So the official idiom is really uh, supposed to be the uh, operator uh, idiom. Okay, now what is what is the, the the distinction between worldly and representational grounding? Okay. Uh, so here's a, a way which I currently think is the is the best way I know of to formulate the distinction between the two conceptions of, of grounding. Uh, we start with defining a notion of uh, descriptive equivalence between sentences. So we say that two sentences are descriptively equivalent when they describe the world as being the same way. So if you take uh, you know a sentence P and Q, uh, 
and you take the other sentence Q and P, so you just reverse uh, the two the two uh, the, the two uh, sentence letters, uh, then you get uh, presumably two sentences which are descriptively equivalent but describe uh, the way the world has been exactly the same way, even though you know they don't do it uh, uh, in the same way, right? Uh, more interesting examples, so the the take the, the, the sentence Tom is a water molecule and take the other sentence Tom is an H2O molecule. Presumably what this is plausible to hold that these two sentences are descriptively equivalent. They describe the world as being the same way, right? Uh, so that's the, 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 the basic notion I, I use in my definition. Uh, then another notion uh, is required to state what to define worldly and representational. Uh, this is the notion of ground theoretic uh, equivalence. So I say that two sentences A and B are ground theoretically equivalent. When you can substitute one for the other in grounding statements, salva veritate, so more formally, uh, if and only if whatever A helps to ground, B helps to ground in the same way and vice versa, if that's the first condition. And the second one is that whatever grounds A uh, grounds B and vice versa. So that's what I mean by uh, sentences A and B to be uh, to be ground theoretically equivalent. Now the definition of worldly grounding is uh, is now easy to state. Uh, grounding is worldly if and only if any two sentences that are descriptively equivalent are ipso facto ground theoretically equivalent. So provided that the sentence uh, describe the world as being the same way, then they are uh, ground theoretically uh, equivalent. And I say that. Uh, okay. All right. That grounding is representational if it's not uh, worldly. Okay, uh, so just one 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 small point of clarification here. Uh, I'm talking about worldly and representational conceptions of grounding. Uh, I don't mean that these are competing views about what grounding this unique notion is. I do think that there are several notions of grounding. So there are there is one or perhaps more than one uh, worldly notion. Uh, and there is uh, th there is more than one uh, there is one more than one representational notion of grounding. So there's no competition here. Okay, uh, as far as I see things. Okay, so we have the notion of worldly grounding. I'm not. I'm going to work exclusively with that uh, worldly notion from now on. Now on. Uh, okay. So to illustrate a little bit the difference between these two conceptions of grounding, so take first uh, uh, Kit Fine's uh, paper Guide to Ground. In that paper, uh, he actually characterizes two notions of grounding, a representational notion via a, a proof theoretic system and a worldly notion via his truth maker semantics. Okay. So he's aware of that. He's aware that the notions that he characterizes are not, uh, are not the same because, they, you know, uh, but uh, that's, the, that's the case. Uh, so to illustrate his representational notion, so take the sentence John walks and uh, the conjunctive sen sentence, John walks and John walks. I say that they are descriptively equivalent. They describe the world as being the same way, but in fine system, uh, the first fact, so John, John, the fact that John walks grounds the fact that John walks and uh, John walks, okay? So given that this holds in fine system, uh, the two sentences cannot be uh, ground theoretically uh, equivalent, okay? Uh, because and I, and, and I here assume that grounding is irreflexive, or at least in, in this case, uh, 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 I mean, there are counterexamples to, to irreflexivity, but they are they are uh, really exotic. So I'm, I'm supposing that we're not in, in such cases here. Okay. Uh, so in a recent paper, I, I give a semantics for a, a, a similar system, uh, and uh, Francesca has been working uh, a lot on uh, also representational. Uh, on a representational notion of grounding. Uh, she, she's, she focuses on, 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 on the logical notion of grounding. Uh, I'm focusing and find focuses on the metaphysical notion, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring these, uh, these uh, differences, uh, uh, at least here. Uh, okay, and as I previously uh, uh, mentioned, I take uh, Fine's uh, semantics, so, so the semantics that he presents in, uh, in Guide to Ground, to characterize a notion that uh, I take to be uh, to be worldly. Okay. Uh, in grounding and truth function and functions and in uh, the first paper that I wrote with Alex Kyle, uh, we target uh, a worldly notion. Okay. Just to uh, yeah, give some illustrations. 
But let me turn to factual identity. So I've, I've characterized worldly grounding, and now I'm going to say more about factual uh, identity. Uh, so I define the factual identity operator, okay, uh, simply using the notion of descriptive equivalence. Okay, so the idea is that A triple bar B holds if and only if the sentences A and B are descriptive equivalent. So the, the, the operator trip, triple bar is really uh, the operator corresponding to the predicate of being descriptively equivalent. Okay, so there's nothing, uh, there's something syntactically new, uh, but conceptually there's nothing new here. Uh, I think we can render in English uh, a claim like A triple bar B as for it to be the case that A is or just is for it to be the case that B, right? Uh, and that's going to be, this claim is going to be important in, in, a, in, a, in what follows, okay? So for convenience, we may uh, read these, uh, these, these claims as A and B are factually identical, even though, I mean, strictly speaking, this is not true because A and B are sentences uh, anyway. Uh, and this notion of factual identity is uh, also central to the papers I mentioned before. And it's a notion that has been uh, extensively studied by uh, Agustin Navallo and Kian Dor. So Navallo in his book, The Construction of Logical Space and Kian Dor in his massive paper uh, called To Be F is To Be G. So this is the target, uh, the target notion, right? Okay. Alex and I like the idea that we can define worldly grounding in terms of factual identity, okay? I will not make this presupposition here, okay? Uh, what I will do nevertheless is exploit a weaker claim, uh, and it's the claim that uh, worldly grounding satisfy, satisfies the principle of closure uh, that you have uh, on the slide, which says that uh, if A and B are factually equivalent, uh, so if A triple bar B uh, holds, then uh, they uh, are uh, ground theoretically uh, equivalent. Okay, so that's the uh, that's really the, the, the claim I'm going to use uh, in, in, in the following. Uh, actually, I'm going to use only an implication of that claim, so not the whole the full the full the full claim itself. Right. Okay. All right. So we have that notion of factual identity when you're uh, a logician, uh, when you're, especially when you're both a metaphysician and a logician, uh, you want to know what logic this uh, metaphysical notion uh, uh, obeys, right? Conforms to. Uh, so in the 2010 paper, I advocated a, a, a system uh, for uh, the logic of factual identity, which I then called factual equivalence. Uh, and uh, the system is the, is the following. So it's, a, it's an axiomatic system. You have a set of axioms and a set of rules, which take you from axioms to, uh, to theorems. It's a very poor system uh, because uh, the sentences of the system have the form blah, blah, triple bar, blah, blah, okay? Where the blah, blahs are built from atomic formulas, negation, disjunction, and conjunction. So in particular, you don't have any embedding of, uh, of, uh, of the triple bar. Uh, operator. So it's a very expressively, uh, very, very weak uh, uh, language. Okay. Uh, and the, the system that I defended there is, uh, has been put forward by RB Angels as a system for what he calls analytic equivalence. So I, I'm, don't, I'm not in the business of talking about analyticity here. Uh, I, 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 just, I just thought that uh, this system was a correct system for the notion of factual uh, identity, right? So I'm not going to go through the system. One important thing to to point out, though, uh, is that conjunction and, and uh, disjunction uh, behave uh, in a symmetric way, okay, in this system. So for any principle involving uh, conjunction, you have the same principle, but with negation, uh, with a disjunction uh, in its place uh, in the system. So that's holds for the axioms and that's also holds for the, uh, for the rules. Okay, so uh, again, conjunction and disjunction behave in a completely symmetric uh, way. All right, now, first objection, uh, one objection, important objection to this, uh, to this suggestion, to, so to the su suggestion that the, pre the, the, the logic I've just introduced is the correct logic for, uh, for factual identity. So this is an objection that I and Kremer and, and, and Roski uh, found independently. So actually at that point, we communicate even before the papers were 
uh, were, were, were published because yeah, so, so we, we found the same, the same, the same issue uh, uh, with, with the system in question. More precisely, the issue has to do with the combination of A11 and closure. So what is A11? This is the axiom of distributivity of uh, disjunction over conjunction. Okay, so A10 is the other, the dual axiom of distributivity of conjunction over disjunction. A11 is distributive of distributivity of disjunction over conjunction. Okay, so it's the combination of this uh, axiom with closure, okay, which uh, creates problems. So the argument is uh, the following. Uh, we start with two sentences, one and two, uh, which are taken to be true. So they, they, the, the, the letter R here stands for a, for a true sentence and H as well. Uh, and we may suppose, we, we suppose that these two sentences are completely independent from a ground narrative point of view. So R might be uh, the, uh, the sentence that this car is red and H might be uh, the sentence that this desk is hot, let's say. Okay, so right, completely independent sentences. Uh, the first claim, so the first sentence is that R grounds R or uh, falsehood, so take any old contradiction here. Uh, and the second uh, claim is that uh, H grounds R or H. So as far as I know, every logic, uh, well, I mean, the argument is, is, is not based on particular logic. So it's based on, on intuitive consideration. So I should, I should really be careful here. Uh, so given that R and H are uh, independent sentences, one and two are highly plausible. Okay, right. Uh, now, given that one and two are true, then we can infer three, okay, which says that R and H together ground the conjunction of, uh, on one hand, R or the falsum, and on the other hand, R or H, okay. Now, using A11 and closure, okay, so that's where these, these guys uh, come into the picture, uh, we can move from three to four, that says that R and H together ground the disjunction of R and uh, the conjunction of the falsum uh, and H. Okay, so that's really the distributivity uh, uh, axiom that's used here, right? And now there's a problem. Uh, why is there a problem? The problem is that uh, H plays no role in this, uh, in, in grounding the disjunction, okay? And, and this is a central assumption, uh, grounds uh, should be wholly relevant to what they ground. Okay, so each part of a ground should be wholly relevant to uh, what uh, is in the end grounded. Okay, so the, point, the problem here is that H, okay, which appears uh, on the left uh, of the plane, uh, plays no role in grounding the whole thing. Okay. All right, so that's the, 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 the essence of the objection. Okay, and now there's the question of what, uh, what to do with this, uh, this objection. So I've used some uh, principles here, like I've, I've used intuitive considerations, well, I've used intuition, so to speak, to justify one and two. Uh, I've said, look, I mean, from one and two, you can uh, intuitively infer three. Okay, so we, one could question these, these moves, but I think that uh, the, the, the underlying principles uh, uh, are validated in, in, in any plausible system for the logic of, of grounding, so I'm, I don't want to question these uh, these principles uh, there. So what I want to question is really the com combination of A11 and uh, and closure. Now I think that it is A11 that must be abandoned because uh, closure cannot really, as I'm going to argue, uh, be uh, be uh, rejected. So if you look closely at the argument, you will see that uh, it invokes A11, of course, but uh, it also invokes uh, only a, conse a consequence of closure. So not closure as a whole, but only a consequence of closure, which I call closure star, if A and B are factually equivalent. So if A triple bar B holds, then whatever, whichever fact grounds A also grounds B. Okay, so it's, it's really a, a strict consequence of the, uh, of the initial principle. Now, translate that into English. Okay, so that reads, uh, if for it to be the case that A is for it to be the case that B, then given any phi, 
if it's being the case that phi makes it the case that A, then it's being the case that phi also makes it the case that B, right? And I, it's hard for me to see how one could reject that claim, okay, once it is, you know, formulated that, that way, okay? So that's why I don't think we can reasonably reject closure star. And that's why I, I think that, well, what remains to be done is to reject uh, 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 the uh, axiom A11, so the distributive utility, sorry, of disjunction over conjunction, okay? Now, obviously, there's a challenge now because uh, we had a logic, a nice logic, which uh, had A11. Uh, we want to drop A11, question what logic do we have for uh, factual identity? We must uh, start again and try to devise a principal logic for that, uh, for that notion. Uh, and of course, one that fails to validate A11. Okay. So I did propose such a logic in the paper on the logic of factual equivalence, okay? And uh, I backed this logic by uh, intuitive semantical consideration. So it's not a logic that, it's not a purely, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not a system that's based only on, on sheer intuitions. I, I provide semantics for, uh, for the notion that delivers the, the logic in question, okay? Uh, that logic does not have A11 as a theorem, uh, and it can actually, be axiomatized exactly uh, as the previous logic, so Angel's logic, referring to the axiomatization I mentioned before, with, with, uh, without A11, so by dropping A11. Okay, so it's a nice uh, thing about this axiomatization that uh, I forgot to say, but I mentioned it on, on the slide, uh, was proposed by Kit Fine, that you can get the new system simply by dropping one, one uh, the, the problematic axiom, right? Uh, in that paper, I actually give two semantic characterizations uh, of, of the system, one in Fine's Truthmaker semantical framework and the other one in my own super sentential uh, framework. So I like a lot my own framework, but I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you how things work with respect to Fine's uh, framework uh, instead. Uh, okay, so this, this is a slide on the basics of Truthmaker semantics. I'm not going to you know, go deep there. Uh, so you define a model as, as, a, as, a, as a tuple uh, of four elements. Uh, so you first have a set of states, which is a non-empty set. You have a fusion operation on, uh, on that set state that behaves in the way uh, fusions are supposed to behave. So I'm, I'm cheating here, but because I don't want to read them, uh, the condition. Uh, and then you have uh, two functions, f and uh, v and f, uh, which take, uh, each atom into a possibly empty uh, set of states uh, that is supposed to be closed under fusion. So V of P, if P is an atomic formula, is uh, the set of the verifiers of, of P and F of P, the set of its falsifiers. Mm -hmm. Then you have, uh, you define the falsifiers and verifiers for all uh, the truth functional uh, compounds of, um, that you can, uh, formulas that you can get from the uh, atomic formulas uh, in the regular uh, Fanian way. So I just one thing here, I'm using what, what he calls the inclusive semantics for disjunction, okay? Uh, for, for, no, for the verifiers of, of disjunctions and for the falsifiers uh, of conjunctions. Um, okay, uh, so we can discuss that if you, if you, if you want. Uh, and then what you have to, so that's, that, that's important. Uh, you have uh, the, the truth clause for uh, the uh, statements of equivalence. So A triple bar B holds in a model if and only if A and B have the same verifiers in the model, okay? Uh, so this I take to be a very intuitive way of, you know, making the semantics for the, these factual uh, uh, identity or equivalence uh, operator. And then you say that A triple bar B is valid if it holds uh, in every model, right? Uh, and that semantics delivers you uh, what I told you before, namely a uh, fine system for angels analytic equivalence minus axiom A11, right? So that's what you get. Okay. Uh, now to uh, the uh, objection to that logic, okay? So the 2016 logic, I take it, improves on the 2010 logic because it, you know, always want to escape one one important objection, but there's a further objection to this uh, 
to this uh, to this 2016 uh, logic. Okay, so this objection uh, appears or is formulated in in a forthcoming paper by uh, a young philosopher called Benjamin Brass McKee. It was formulated to me uh, by Peter Fritz five years ago already, uh, and uh, Lisa Vogt uh, uh, mentioned that objection to me last year, right? Uh, so I was in conversation with the, 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 the last two, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, present so the, the objection first, and then uh, my, my reaction to that to that to, to that reaction. So. I'm going to I'm, I reconstruct the, the, the objection in the clearest possible way. So maybe I'm uh, I'm not doing justice to the particular way that Fritz uh, made the object available. I don't know, but uh, bear with me. Uh, so I first define a, a, a notion of transparency. So an operator, a monadic operator, is, is said to be transparent for factual identity, for only for all A and B from A triple bar B and O B. You can infer O A. Okay, so it's so a kind of regular notion of, of uh, transparency. Uh, and I say that an operator is opaque if it's not uh, transparent, okay? So typically an operator that is opaque is going to yield violations of Leibniz's law uh, for that, uh, for, for factual identity, okay? Now, the argument, uh, so the opacity objection uh, starts with uh, a strong claim which is the main, the, the most substantial claim of the, uh, of the objection, which is that given that triple bar is a form of identity, okay, uh, all operators that can be defined recursively from truth functional connectives. Uh, sorry, I'm just, yes, from truth functional connectives, uh, the triple bar operator and given, perhaps given sentences must be transparent. So that's the big claim that that's, starts uh, of the, uh, the objection. Okay. Now, the argument goes on. If the proposed logic is correct, so if the 2016 logic is correct, then at least one operator of the form, not blah, triple bar, not B, uh, must be opaque. Why is that? So here's the argument for this very last claim. Suppose that uh, all operators of that kind uh, are transparent. So this is a reasoning by reductio. Then we can reason as follows. So we have a, a, a three-line argument. The first line is the assumption that we just made, namely that all operators, uh, uh, well, that's, that's a consequence of the uh, uh, assumption that all operators of, of the kind in question are transparent, okay? Uh, so we should have that for all A, B, from A triple bar B and not B triple bar not B, we can infer not A triple bar. B. Now, given that in the system not B triple bar not B is valid, then we can move to line two. Uh, for all A B from A triple bar B, we can infer not A triple bar not B. Uh, and given that two is true, uh, then we can move to three that says that uh, essentially uh, if A triple bar B is a logical truth or a theorem or call it uh, the way you want, then not triple bar A, uh, uh, not A triple bar not B, that must also be uh, a logical true, okay? Now, it turns out that uh, this rule, the rule of inference uh, mentioned under three is not valid in the logic that I proposed. Actually, Kit Fine showed that adding that very rule to the system, to the 2016 system, is equivalent to adding the problematic axiom A11, okay? All right. So that's the, the my reconstruction of the uh, of the opacity uh, of the opacity objection. Okay. All right. Now, of course, uh, again, there is this uh, second uh, the, the, the the claim the, the assumption made uh, uh, in the second bullet point that that is that is crucial here. I'm going to come back to it in my reply to the objection uh, later on. Now. What's the proper reaction here? So one very natural propo proposal uh, is the one uh, that uh, is, is, is the move that Brass uh, himself makes. Uh, the idea is to change the definition, uh, the, the semantic clause for uh, A triple bar B, and to say that A triple bar B holds in a model, if only if not only A and B share their verifiers, but uh, 
also if they uh, share their uh, falsifiers. So the condition is that they, A and B must both share their verifiers and their falsifiers. Okay. Uh, a recent proposal, so that there was a paper that I hadn't properly read before the last uh, the talk last, last week, which I've read and actually uh, Samuel Elgin proposes exactly the same, uh, the same semantics form uh, for uh, the notion of uh, uh, for a notion of, of, of identity or equivalence that he's uh, focusing on. Okay. Now, once you have these the, the semantics, uh, then both A10 and A11 are out. Okay. Uh, so uh, the problematic A11 is out, but also A10. Uh, another result is that uh, now again, as in the angel system. Conjunction and disjunction behave in a completely symmetrical way, so that's restored. Uh, and these, uh, and the uh, the rule that that makes you go from a, a triple bar B to not a triple bar not B is valid, unlike in my uh, in my own system. And, and that was the basis of the uh, objection, previous objection, the opacity objection against my system. So this proposal allows one to escape the previous uh, objection. Okay, so. The move is quite nice or looks quite nice because it allows one to escape both the objection against angel system and the objection against the 2016 system. Okay. Uh, a small remark here, we don't have any sound and complex system for that semantics. Okay. So we have that for angel system, we have that for my 2016 system, but we don't have that uh, at least yet for, for that other system. I tried to find something uh, uh, I didn't manage, I think Kit Fine also tried to find something you manage. So this seems to be a, a you know, a, a, there seems to be a difficult, difficult task to, to uh, here, right? Anyway, so my reply to the opacity objection, remember the, uh, the, uh, the crucial assumption that the objectors uh, made, that was that all operators definable recursively solely from two functional connectives the triple bar operator, operator and uh, given sentences must be transparent. Okay, this premise uh, is not uh, supported by arguments. So be that in Brest McKee's uh, paper or in uh, uh, the personal communications uh, I had from uh, uh, from uh, Fort and uh, uh, and Fritz. Okay, now this premise I claim is not obvious. Okay, why is is it uh, not obvious? Well, I mean. In particular, uh, it is not obvious that for any B, uh, the operator not blah, triple bar not B should be transparent for uh, factual identity. Why is that? Well, otherwise it would be obvious that for all A, B from A triple bar B, we could infer not A triple bar B. Uh, and I don't think that this is obvious at all. Uh, I translate that uh, in English. Uh, it's not obvious at all that this from the sentence uh, for it to be the case that A just is for it to be the case that B, you can infer that for it to be the case that not A just is for it to be the case that not B. I claim that this is not obvious. Maybe that's true, okay? But if it is, uh, if you want to convince me that this is true, you must give me an argument. I don't think that the attainment is, uh, if correct, uh, obvious. Okay. Now, let me go further in my reply to the, uh, to the opacity uh, objection. It seems to me that one seems to me clear that once we acknowledge that what it takes for a sentence to be true does not fix what it takes for a sentence to be false, okay, uh, that is to say for its negation to be true, uh, then we should uh, acknowledge that uh, the sentence for it to be true that A is for it to be true that B may hold why the sentence for it to be false that A uh, is for it to be false that B uh, does not hold, okay. Um, Okay, now, so, all right. Now in, in standard possible world semantics, okay, uh, we are in a situation where, when you know what it takes for a sentence to be true, you thereby know what it takes for uh, that sentence to be false, okay? Just like the, the, the complement of the, the set of all worlds and then you, you, you get what, what you want. But in other frameworks and in particular in, in the truth maker framework, that's not the case, right? Uh, 
uh, you may once you have fixed the, the, the verifiers of, of a given say atomic formula uh, then you still have to have some work to do uh, to uh, state what the sets of the falsifiers of the uh, atomic formula formula is right so there's there's a divorce be between truth and falsity in that framework uh, and for that reason uh, i think again that we should acknowledge that in such a framework it may be that for it to be true that a is for it to be true that b uh, without it being the case that for it to be false that a is for it to be force that be right so this is really specific to these frameworks where like truth maker uh, semantics where uh, truth and falsity are divorced in that in, in that way uh, now in this particular framework so i've, I've been working with truth maker frameworks and uh, i go on with the same framework uh, in this framework uh, the sentence for it to be the case that a just is for it to be the case that b is most naturally understood as expressing that a and b have the same verifiers okay that's really the most natural way of interpreting that the, 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 the sentence in question. Uh, and accordingly, for it to be false, that is not the case, uh, the, the case, for, sorry, for it to be the case that not A uh, just is for it to be the case that not B. So that sentence is most naturally understood as expressing that A and B have the same falsifiers. Okay. Uh, now, in the framework, uh, you don't have the entailment that I've mentioned earlier. Why? Because Again, uh, it's not because A and B share their verifiers that they must share their falsifiers. If you need a counter example, just use the uh, sentences that, that, that are linked to ax axioms A10 and A11, okay? So you take for A, P and Q or R, and for B, P and Q or P and R, okay? Now, by the semantics, uh, A and B have the same verifiers, uh, but they don't necessarily have the same uh, falsifiers. Uh, otherwise, uh, axiom A11 would be valid, okay, in the, in the semantics uh, that, that, that I propose, right? So that's that's a clear counterexample to the entailment in, uh, in question. Okay. All right. Let me now move to uh, okay. To propositional identity, okay. So it's natural uh, in uh, once you, I mean, you have the notion of factual identity uh, at hand to define a further operator, uh, the, trip, the, 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 the double arrow operator, which I call an operator for propositional identity. Uh, uh, for the, it's natural to define, define something, uh, an operator of that sort uh, along the following line. So you say that A double arrow B uh, is defined as a triple bar B and uh, not A triple bar not B. Okay. Uh, in the truth maker framework, uh, such a statement, a statement of type A double R or B, uh, holds in a model if and only if A and B have the same verifiers and the same falsifiers. Okay, so that's uh, immediate. It's natural uh, to use the label propositional identity for that, for the notion expressed by this new uh, operator, right? Uh, at least if we grant that a proposition, a proposition is individuated both by, by its truth conditions and its falsity conditions. Okay. So that's why I use this label propositional identity there. Now, of course, the truth maker semantics for this new operator is exactly the semantics that Russ McKee gives for the triple bar operator, right? Now there are two possibilities. Either he targets the notion that I take triple bar to express, namely the notion expressed by for it to be the case that blah is for it to be the case that blah, uh, in which case I think he's wrong. He provides the wrong semantics, as I've argued uh, before, because I argued that the, the correct semantic act, at least in the truth maker framework, for that notion uh, appeals to identifications of verif sets of verifiers, but not uh, in addition to that, uh, to identification of sets of falsifiers. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that it targets a stronger notion, okay, uh, perhaps even the notion that I call uh, propositional identity, uh, in which case I don't have anything to object, okay, because uh, I'm really focusing here on factual identity and, and, its, uh, and its semantics. Now, I should say that he actually uses the label propositional identity for the triple bar operator, which suggests, uh, doesn't show, but it suggests that he, his second option is, is correct. I have defined propositional identity in terms of uh, 
in terms of factual identity. Now, interesting question is whether there is a way of expressing in English or any other language uh, propositional identity uh, that uh, does not rely on factual identity, right? So is there like a, a primitive way, if, if you want, of expressing uh, propositional identity, say in English? Here are two candidates. So I took them from uh, Ryo's book and, and Dor's paper. Okay, so the first claim, Ryo's claim, take, the, the claim taken from Ryo's book is for there to be a table, just is for there to be some things arranged table-wise. Uh, and the claim taken from uh, Dor's paper is for Obama to be a bachelor, is for Obama to be an unmarried man. Uh, it may appear that uh, the rule of negation introduction uh, holds for these constructions, namely, for instance, that you can move from uh, the, the door uh, claim to for Obama not to be a bachelor is for Obama not to be an unmarried man. So it might sound that, that you know, this inference, uh, this negation introduction inference is, uh, is valid, right, intuitively at least. Uh, I say it seems because I'm, I'm not even sure. It's, it's not as if I had like super strong intuitions there. But, uh, uh, now, be that as it may, uh, it's not clear to me whether there is a schematic way of expressing the notion uh, 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 of propositional identity in English. Okay, so the locution for it to be the case that A is for it to be the case that B is a natural suggestion, okay? So it's a natural candidate for expressing propositional identity. Uh, but I've argued that this notion, this locution, sorry, uh, expresses factual identity, not propositional identity, right? Which is, uh, which is a stronger notion, okay? Now, if you look at Dor and Rayo's uh, uh, texts, you see that they choose this very form uh, to express the notions of identity that they respectively uh, discuss. Now, there is some evidence, and things are not completely clear there, that they don't have factual identity in mind, uh, actually, uh, in, their, in, their, in their works, uh, but that they, they rather have something like propositional identity in mind. Okay. Things are not completely clear. Uh, perhaps they don't, they, they, they don't make, they, 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 they conflate the two notions somehow. They don't make the proper, properly have uh, the distinction uh, in mind. Now, if this is correct, then uh, they should, uh, 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 they should, uh, sorry, not use, I uh, forgot the negation uh, uh, locution here. Uh, they, they should not use the, the, the form in question to express the notion they have in mind, because again, that locution uh, should be used for, I mean, naturally expresses factual identity, not propositional identity. Uh, and so again, if they have uh, propositional identity in mind, uh, they should not use the locution to express it. Okay. Now, last uh, slide. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a slide that, that's a little bit boring, I guess, because it's about terminology. So I've talked about identity, but also equivalence, factual identity, factual equivalence. Uh, in my older work on, on, on that, uh, on, these, on these topics, I, I, I used only equivalence. With Alex, we use identity instead. Uh, now, uh, is there a, a, a big difference between the two, uh, the two uh, ways of speaking? Uh, in a way, yes, okay. Uh, so if you look, look again at the opacity objection, okay. Uh, what we have there is that on my account of, of the logic of, fact, of the triple bar uh, operator, some operators of type not blah, triple bar, not B are opaque for uh, triple bar, okay. Now, a natural reaction, and I'm thinking here of uh, several people, uh, in particular, uh, Pierre Saint-Germier last week, but uh, I think that was also uh, 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 Lisa Vogt's reaction and, and Peter Fritz's uh, reaction. Uh, the natural reaction is to say, look, uh, if uh, the triple bar operator is supposed to express a notion of identity, okay, then surely all the operators of that type uh, should be transparent, okay? Uh, the, the view, being that roughly, you know, identity in whichever guise should obey a relevant notion of Leibniz's law. Uh, and of course, Leibniz's law should be restricted somehow uh, uh, because there are some, some potentially problematic contexts, but at least 
uh, these are not the, the contexts in question are not supposed to be uh, do not appear to be uh, problematic contexts. So, so that's that's the natural uh, reaction. Now, the easy reply here is 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 just we change the the label. Okay, talk about uh, factual equivalence instead of factual identity. Okay, that notion which I call factual identity, factual equivalence, is an equivalence relation. So uh, it deserves the the, the label uh, factual equivalence. Okay. Uh, if you have a problem with calling that identity, then just keep uh, equivalence uh, instead, right? Uh, now, by contrast, okay, on my account of the logic of the triple bar operator, all operators of type not blah, 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 double arrow not B uh, are transparent for uh, the, the double arrow uh, operator, okay? So you don't have opacity here, okay? Uh, now, as a consequence, the label propositional identity is not misleading in the way that factual identity perhaps is. Uh, but uh, given that, given how uh, the triple, the, sorry, the, the double arrow operator is defined in terms of uh, the triple bar operator, uh, if you use factual equivalence for uh, the latter, then it's better to use propositional equivalence for uh, for the former. Okay. So these are all, you know, uh, questions of 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 of. Uh, terminology, which uh, are not really uh, very important, but uh, still, I mean, if, if, if using one piece of terminology uh, leads people into, uh, you know, wrong uh, uh, objections, then it's better to change the terminology, right? Okay, uh, so that's, that's it. Okay, so I... Okay. Okay, remove the... Yeah. Thank you very 